Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second part of our mangrove workshop. The, this part of the workshop will be covering mangrove extent mapping and time series analysis. And we will also be covering how to perform an accuracy assessment of our resulting map. So for this part of the workshop, we will be exploring some of the themes that we discussed last week and going through the methodology of how we can actually create those maps using Google Earth Engine. This workshop is structured as a series of three one and a half hour sessions, the first occurring on November 5th, which can be found on our set website. Uh, today's session on the 12th, and then there will be a third session on the 19th. The same content will be presented at two different times each day. The first session happening between 10 and 11.30 Eastern Standard Time, and the second session happening between 3 and 4.30 Eastern Standard Time. All webinar recordings, PowerPoint presentations, and the homework assignment can be found through the appliedsciences.nasa.gov website uh, by following this link, and they can be found after each session. And if you have any questions that were not answered during the lecture, you can follow up by emailing us at our NASA emails. Again, there are three homework assignments assigned after each weekly part. So there will be another assignment after today's workshop. And answers must be submitted via Google Forms. In order to achieve the certificate of completion, you must attend all three live webinars, complete the homework assignments by the deadline, which you can access through the RSET website, and you will receive certificates approximately two months after the completion of, these, of the course from Marnes Martins. There are several prerequisites that were posted on the RSET website for this course. If you don't already have it, you will need to download version 3.10 of QGIS. You will also need to download and install the class accuracy plugin for QGIS through uh, the following link. There, we also have instructions for download available on the RSET website for this workshop. For additional prerequisites, we recommend the fundamentals of remote sensing and intro to JavaScript for Google Earth Engine, since we will be diving in pretty quickly to coding in Google Earth Engine. I will be covering a bit of a review of intro to Earth Engine, but we will not be going into it extensively. You will also need to create a Google Earth Engine account if you do not already have one. We've also provided some optional links that can help you as you're trying to learn Google Earth Engine, including a beginner's cookbook, a guide to managing assets, and an introduction to Google Earth Engine tutorial. For today's workshop, we will be going over the basics of Google Earth Engine. And by the end of this presentation, you will also understand how to create a mangrove extent map using a random forest classification and create a time series for mangrove extent change. Over the course of the workshop today, we will first be doing a quick review of Google Earth Engine, followed by a review of time series analysis and what we mean by that analysis. And then I will be going through a demo of performing a time series analysis for Guyana as an example study site. We will go over how to set up our map and filter a Landsat composite, then we will be constructing a random forest model. We will then do a time series comparison, a new random forest classification for that comparison. We will go through calculating mangrove area from our resulting maps. We will cover exporting layers of interest. And finally, we will go through a demo of the QJS class accuracy plugin to determine how accurate our resulting model is. So as a quick review of Google Earth Engine, this is a free open source cloud-based geospatial processing platform. It comprises of a catalog of publicly available data sets such as Landsat imagery or land cover imagery, Google's computation power, an application programming interface or an API, as well as a code editor. We will not be covering the API today. It's more for exploratory purposes to see what data is available through Google Earth Engine, whereas the code editor is more useful to us for actually performing robust calculations and analyses. What's great about Google Earth Engine is that it is freely available to the public and it grants us 
fairly easy access to satellite imagery from a number of NASA and ESA satellites, including Landsat and Sentinel. The way Earth Engine works is that it is a cloud-based platform with client and server functions. Essentially, the user, which will be us, manipulates proxy objects through the server. So we work with the Earth Engine interface to manipulate these objects and send instructions to Google for processing. So instead of performing these analyses on our computer's engine, we are sending requests to Google and results are being sent back to the web browser for display. Everything in Earth Engine defaults to WGS84 projections, which is important as we learn how to export our data and if we decide to work with it in ArcMap, QJS, or another platform. Earth Engine grants us a lot of capabilities. It has access to data at a planetary scale, and again, it grants us fairly easy access to satellites like Landsat. However, there are quota restrictions due to its open source nature, and you can be limited in terms of the user memory. As you get more familiar with Earth Engine, we, you can learn how to work around some of this and how to process different requests to minimize how much data processing you're actually requesting from Earth Engine. And again, this is just a visualization of what Earth Engine is doing. The user or the coder is sending a request to Google's computer processing power using these geospatial data sets of interest. The requests are being sent to Google where computations and analyses are done. Then the results are sent back and displayed on our web browser. So today we will be using the code editor side of Google Earth Engine. Again, we will not be focusing on the API. This is for more detailed analyses, such as the one that we'll be running today. It involves using a JavaScript code editor. There is Python availability, but we will not be covering that. There's also a map display, an API reference documentation, or the docs tab, the console output, or the console tab, a task manager, which is the tasks tab, and then an interactive map query, the inspector tab. Again, as a quick review of Glossier Terms, a Google Earth Engine asset is an external data set loaded into Google Earth Engine for analysis. Tables are vector data in shapefile format. So for example, this could include ground truth location data or a shapefile of your study area. An image refers to raster data composed of one or more bands. So for example, distance to stream. And then an image collection is, is a stack or time series of images like Landsat 8 imagery. So we will be working with an image collection today and mosaicing that to an image for easier working purposes. If you're unfamiliar with what Google Earth Engine looks like, this is an example of what the code editor looks like and what we will be working in today. And after we go through some more introduction, I'll be moving over to displaying my screen in Google Earth Engine. If at any point you are looking for extra help with understanding some of the code we'll be using, I highly recommend exploring the Docs tab in Google Earth Engine. There's also a developer's guide through the Google Earth Engine website. And then there is a Google Earth Engine developers group available as a Google group that it works like Stack Overflow where you can ask questions or you can explore questions that other users have asked that may reflect something that you are trying to do in your own work. Now we'll be moving into actually performing the time series of mangrove extent for today's workshop. We want to perform a time series because we want to understand change over time. So as Lola talked about in the last part of the workshop, mangroves change over time due to different natural and anthropogenic effects. So we can use a time series analysis to understand how mangroves have changed over time. We can identify areas of loss and gain 
and then understand patterns of change to see if those changes are linked to any sort of source in particular or source that we are interested in studying. So this image is an example of what we are hoping to end up with at the end of this series. This is showing a zoomed in image of mangrove extent in Guyana for 2000, 2010, and 2020. For time series analysis, we are going to be examining the same study area over several years. So we are going to focus on specific years of interest. Depending on the type of study you are conducting, you may be interested in decadal information, you may be interested in annual information, and we can apply the techniques that we are going to review today to a number of these different studies. So for example, this is a comparison of mangrove extent in Colombia in 2000, which is the map on the left, and 2019, which is the map on the right. To do this analysis, we are going to be using Landsat data. So this is a representation of a false color composite of Landsat data in 2000 and 2019. And we are going to figure out how to train a model to interpret this data to help us map mangroves and determine the amount of change over this time period. So we can compare values of different indices like normalized difference vegetation index across different years to understand how mangroves are changing over time. And I will be defining some of these indices later on as we go through the demo, but this example index, the normalized difference vegetation index is essentially a display of greenness and how green a certain pixel is that we're studying. So higher values of NDVI indicate higher levels of vegetation, i.e. mangroves. We're able to plug this information into a model then to determine where mangroves are found without having to do the heavy lifting of doing ground-based studies of delineating where mangroves are on the ground. So through Earth Engine and using Landsat data, we can create samples of areas with and without mangroves using this imagery. And machine learning allows us to use these samples to detect mangroves across a region. For this workshop, we will be using a random forest classification. This is a type of machine learning. And machine learning essentially uses statistics to identify patterns in large data sets. It is a type of artificial intelligence that learns from data. This is a tool that allows us to process large quantities of data to answer particular research questions. A random forest classification is an ensemble tree-based learning algorithm. Essentially what that means is we are creating trees that are looking at a single pixel of our data and each tree is looking at different variables such as the NDVI, such as different bands of Landsat imagery that may help us figure out where mangroves are. And each tree is using that information to make a vote. So one tree may vote that that pixel is mangrove, another may vote that it's not. And these decision trees select the best option based on how many trees vote in one direction versus another. And this is a type of supervised uh, machine learning because we are giving this training data. So you do not have to be an expert on machine learning to use it in your research. This is kind of a black box where we are giving input and training data to a machine learning algorithm and then achieving some sort of output. So we can only observe what goes into the algorithm and what comes out of it. And then we can manipulate those inputs until we get a result that we feel reflects um, the area of interest more accurately. So again, this random forest classification constructs these decision trees for each sample. Based on the predictors, these bands from Landsat, the trees will vote for each pixel to detect mangrove versus not mangrove and the most supported value is assigned to each pixel. So you are welcome to delve further into machine learning, but again, you don't need to be an expert on it for us to move forward and actually apply it to this particular study. 
essentially the process that we'll be using to run this random forest classification is we will create samples based on the available Landsat imagery within Google Earth Engine. We will then feed these samples into our random forest classification, so into our machine learning model. And then we will take these results and we will continually refine our model until we feel that we are happy with the results. After we have created a map that we feel is accurate, we then need to validate it to see if it's actually accurate. Understanding the accuracy of our model allows us to understand how reliable our results are. And we can use stratified random samples to run an independent accuracy assessment. So if you have available ground truth data, this is also something you can use to run an accuracy assessment. But in this case, we do not have that. So we're going to create our own sample data. We are going to then visit each point using satellite imagery, and then we're going to mark if they are correct. So rather than using ground truth data, we are going to zoom in on very specific points that we've created across the landscape, determine is this point mangrove or not mangrove, and then see if the model that we created reflects those points correctly. For this exercise, we'll use the class accuracy plugin in QGIS 3.10. And again, this is another link to that plugin if you don't already have it. And today we're going to go through this iteration once really, but this is a continual process until you get a model that you're happy with. So we run our model, we see how accurate it is, and if it's not accurate or we're not happy with it, we can refine our model. We can input more training data, and we'll go over some other ways that we can refine that model. For today's workshop, we will be using Guyana as our study area. NASA and SERVIR work with in-country partners in countries like Guyana to help them monitor mangroves, and Guyana foresees future flooding and saltwater intrusions as sea levels rise. So in this case, this is an area where mangroves may be threatened by sea level rise. And so we want to understand where mangroves are currently found and how they have changed in the past decade or so. So this study is going to show how, man how mapping mangroves can help us focus conservation practices. Now I'm going to be switching over to the code editor for the rest of the demo. You can follow along with the script by clicking this link. You can also follow along with the PowerPoint presentation that we made available on our set website, which contains all of the code for the analysis that we'll be running today. So if you're following along with the link that I provided, all of the code is already included in the code editor and you can run it as is and you will get the final results of our model. But otherwise, you can type along with me or copy paste some of the code over whichever way suits your learning purposes. For the first part of this analysis, we first need to include our imagery that we're going to be using. So in this case, we're, we're going to be using Landsat 8 Surface Reflectance Tier 1. You can see that it's already been imported for me, but we are going to look for it anyway, just so that we know where to find it. So if you type in, in this search bar at the top of the screen, Landsat 8 Surface Reflectance, we'll see this option pop up. Before we import it, we can click on the title and double check that this is in fact the image collection that we want to use. We can see what the ID is for it. We can see which bands of interest are available and look at the image properties and what's actually contained in this data set. And this looks good, so I'm happy with what I've imported. The other data set that we need to import is SRTM digital elevation information. Again, we can search for it up top. And we'll see our SRTM digital elevation data version 4 and then digital elevation 30 meter. The 30 meter option is what we want to be using. Again, this is from the shuttle radar topography mission. 
This is going to provide us with elevation and slope, which we will be using later on to narrow down our study area to areas where mangroves are more likely to be found. And before I jump into actually running the code, I will be going through this demo fairly quickly, and we are not expecting you to necessarily keep up at my pace. However, this workshop is going to be recorded and will be available within 24 hours, so you can refer back to this video as well as the link to the code that I provided. Our first step of this analysis is going to be setting up our map. I like to start off by centering the map to my area of interest so that when I return to the code, it's a lot easier to get started because I'm already centering in on my study area. So in this case, I have drawn a geometry for my area of interest, and this is reflecting the coastline of Guyana. And if I wanted to create a new geometry, all I would have to do is move over to this tool for drawing a shape and I'll select draw a polygon. I will create a new layer and I will start drawing my area of interest. And then I'll exit out of that. So now I have this new polygon. I'm going to get rid of it because I've already drawn one that fits the coastline a bit better. Because we are only interested in mangroves and mangroves are found on the coastline, this seems like it will provide a pretty good study area. As you refine your model more, this is one of the things that we can manipulate. So say I wanted to make my study area a bit more exacting, I could then click on that geometry and move some of these vertices around to hug that coastline a bit better. But for now, I'm pretty happy with that. And so I'm going to center my map around that geometry using dot center object. And then into this, I put the geometry that I want to center on and then my zoom. So right now I'm zoomed at seven. If I wanted to zoom in or out, I could play with that number. So now we're zoomed in a little bit too far. If I zoom out a bit more, to me, that's too far away. So I like seven, but um, you can manipulate that number based on what visually to you is easier to work with. The other thing that I like to do, which is optional, is to set up my map with this satellite base map. So you can either do that through the code so that every time you run this code, it automatically sets up with the satellite baseline. Otherwise, it's going to default to the Google Maps background. You can work with whichever one you think is easier to visualize. I personally think the satellite data is, makes it easier for me to visualize where mangroves are found. All right, so we have our map set up the way we want it, and we have our Landsat and SRTM data pulled in. So the next thing we need to do is we actually need to filter that Landsat composite to a cloud-free mosaic. So Landsat data includes a pixel QA band, which contains information about the quality of each pixel and if those pixels contain clouds or other features that may obscure the data. And we are going to create a function to mask out any of these cloudy pixels. So this function, mask clouds, is something that you will tend to use over and over again. Essentially what it's doing is it is creating these masks in the Landsat imagery and pulling out any sort of data that may have clouds and that we want to remove from the images that we're looking at. So we create this function and it's going to return an image that is updated with a mask that will mask out areas of cloud. Now you'll notice that if we run this, 
because nothing happens yet, this is because we haven't actually asked anything to display on the map. So just keep note of that, that as I'm going through some of this code, until we actually write in code to print something or to add a layer to the map, we won't actually see anything display. However, we can definitely check ourselves by running the code. And the way I'm running the code, I'm on a Mac, so I'm hitting Control Enter. I believe on a Windows, it's Command Enter, or we can hit Run at the top of our code editor. And it, it's great to check as you're going if the code is running. Because for example, if I forgot to include a curly bracket at the end, I will run this code and I will get a syntax error. And I can see that there is an error here. I have an unmatched curly brackets, and that would be this guy. So you'll also notice that you can code things in or out by adding these two dashes. And on a Mac, you can use command and then slash to code out a whole line. And I believe on Windows, it's, it's control slash. Our next step is going to be adding spectral indices to our Landsat data using data that's already provided through this Landsat 8 imagery. So we'll be adding seven indices to the Landsat imagery. So we're going to be using NDVI, Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. This relies on red and near infrared bands to quantify vegetation. NDMI, Normalized Difference Moisture Index, which uses near infrared and shortwave infrared. And this helps us get at vegetation water content. MNDWI is Modified Normalized Difference Water Index, which uses green and shortwave infrared. And this will provide some water information. And then we have a few ratio bands. So we have SR, Simple Ratio, which uses red and near infrared to provide a simple vegetation index. There's ratio 54, which is shortwave infrared and near infrared. This maps water features. Ratio 35 uses red and shortwave infrared to map water features as well. And then we'll also be using GCVI, green chlorophyll vegetation index, which uses near infrared and green to map green leaf biomass. So essentially, we are adding a bunch of different indices that provide some sort of information on not only the vegetation in a pixel, but also water content. And this is because we are looking at mangroves, which are found close to water. So to add these indices, we are going to create a function called add indices L8. And for each of these indices, we are going to actually calculate them out using the bands available. So for NDVI, we are going to take the normalized difference between red and near infrared bands. We are also going to rename this as NDVI. So you'll notice this pattern for each of these lines of code. So from lines 55 to 69, we are performing calculations of the bands that we are interested in, and we are renaming them so that we have bands that are easier for us to work with. And then as the final part of this function, we are going to return our image, which will be our Landsat image, with all of these bands added. So we're going to use dot add bands to add our NDVI, NDMI, and all of the rest of our indices of interest. And again, I will just run that real quick, and I'll notice that I don't have any errors. So, so far, so good. Now we need to actually filter down our Landsat data by date and region. So right now we have Landsat data available globally, but we are only interested in Guyana. So, and we are also only interested in the year 2019 for the moment. So first we're gonna set up our temporal parameters. We are going to create a variable called year, and we're gonna say year equals 2019. And what's nice about setting it up like this is that we can change this line at any point to reflect any year where Landsat 8 data is available. So you'll notice that these next 
couple lines where we create a variable for our start date and our end date. We also include this variable year. So rather than typing out our variable start date equals 2019-01-01, and then having to find these lines of code, I only have to find line 87 and change this around if I decide that I have a different year that I would like to look at. So we are going to look at 2019 minus one. So we're actually going to be looking at 2018 through as much data as we can acquire from 2020. And this is because we are trying to accumulate as much Landsat data as makes sense to create a cloud-free composite. The thing about studying mangroves, especially in areas like Guyana, is you often are studying them in areas that are cloudy and have a lot of rainfall. And so we can't just collect imagery from one month in a year because we are likely to only get cloudy images that are not useful for analysis. So instead, we look at imagery from a year before and a year after, and we look for the best pixel available within that time period, and we mosaic those pixels together to create a cloud-free image. So now we're going to start applying some of these filters and masks to our Landsat 8 imagery. So for that, we are going to create this new variable, L8, and we are going to take our capital L8, our Landsat data. First, we're going to filter it by our start date and end date. So now we've only filtered it down to 2018 to 2020. We are going to use dot map to apply that mass clouds function. And then again, we are applying another function. So we're going to use dot map again. And we are going to add our indices. So NDVI and all the other indices that we are interested in for the purposes of this study. So right now our Landsat imagery is still in an image collection. And we, we could see that if we wanted to just double check ourselves by using print. And if we printed L8, we'll see that it's printing as an image collection. So right now it's not in a format that we can use to run our random forest classification and we need it to be an image. It's also, as you can see, a fairly large image collection because we're still looking at global data. So we need to mosaic our image collection to an image and also filter it down to just our study area. The way we do that is we composite on a per pixel per band basis. We are going to use a median reducer You can use other reducers such as quality mosaic using a band of interest or an index of interest like NDVI. Median works pretty well for filtering out clouds. You don't want to use something like maximum because it is more likely to result in cloudier images. So our dot median reducer works really well and this essentially is mosaicing our data down and then we're going to clip our composite to our area of interest. And just to check ourselves, I'm going to use print, and I'm going to print this new variable. And we can see that now it's an image with 19 bands. And if I expand this and expand the bands, I can see the different bands that Landsat 8 already comes with. And then further below, I can see the indices that we actually added through that function. I'm going to get rid of this. Next, we need to filter down a little bit more using other information that we have available and our prior knowledge about mangroves. So right now, our Landsat data has been filtered to this whole study area, but we know that mangroves are found generally in low elevation, that they are going to have high NDVI values and high MNDWI values because they are highly vegetated and they're associated with water. So the first thing we're going to do is we are going to clip our SRTM data to our study area. So SRTM.clip, and then we are going to use our geometry to clip this data. And the next thing we're going to do is we are going to mask to elevations less than 65 meters. 
So we're going to create a mask called Elevation Mask. We are going to use this clipped SRTM data, and we are going to say we want areas that are less than 65 meters. Now, this is a value that I played around with that worked pretty well. You can refer to other data sets of mangrove studies to explore other values, or this is a value that you can manipulate as we work with our model a bit more. So for example, if I felt that this was not constrictive enough, I would say, okay, give me areas that elevation is less than 45 meters. And if I felt that this was too, too constrictive and I wasn't getting enough of my study area included, then I could raise that number again. But we'll stick with 65 meters for this. And then we will create our NDVI and MNDWI masks. So we are going to call in our composite, so our Landsat image. We are going to select our bands of interest. So here our NDVI band. And we are going to mask to areas that are greater than 0.25. So all of these indices are going to run from negative 1 to 1. Areas that are greater than 0.25 are going to be highly vegetated. And for MNDWI, we want areas that are greater than negative 0.5. And then finally, we want to apply these masks. So we are going to take our Landsat composite and we are going to use dot update mask to mask out areas that are not high vegetation, areas that are not associated with water, and in areas that are too high elevation to support mangroves. So we are making it easier for our model before we actually even run the model. If we run the model across the entire landscape, it is going to be looking at areas of vegetation too far inland to actually be mangroves. So we're going to exclude those areas and just narrow down to where it is already more likely for mangroves to be found. And now we get into actually visualizing those results and seeing what that looks like. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to set up our visualization parameters. We are going to do a false color composite in this case. So I'm going to use bands 5, 6, and 4. I find this easier to use for random forest classifications for mangroves than a true color composite, which would just be the red, green, and blue bands. Um, that is up to personal preference, but you'll see when we display this that it, it's fairly easy to pick out vegetated areas from non-vegetated areas using the false color composite rather than using the true color composite where you can see everything just kind of in the background imagery looks pretty green. And then we are going to use map.addLayer to add this Landsat composite that has been masked to our map. So if we run this, map.addLayer will use composite new, which is, again, our filtered composite that has been masked to our area of interest and clipped to our geometry. We're going to use our visualization parameters, and we are going to give it a name so it's easier for us to pick out from other layers as we add more. And real quick, these numbers for a minimum and maximum are going to be the minimum and maximum values that we are stretching those bands. These are, again, numbers that you can play with for display purposes. They don't actually affect what values are contained in the data. They just affect how the data is displayed. So if I run this, you'll see I now have a layer being added to the map. For now, I'm going to turn off my geometry for the study area so that I can better visualize what Landsat imagery I am left with given these masks that I put in place. So you'll see we have our Landsat data available through false color composite. Areas that are darker red um, and orange are going to be areas that are higher vegetation. So for example, this area where it's dark, rusty orange is pretty likely to be mangroves. Whereas if we move further along, 
we'll see other areas display that are green or are this dark orange, almost black. And those areas are pretty clearly not mangroves. So the false color composite, if you haven't worked with it before, is something to adjust to. But the changes in amount of vegetation appear to be of starker contrast than using a true color composite. Next, we'll be moving on to constructing our random forest model. So the first thing we need to do for this is actually prepare training data and predictors that we'll be feeding into our model. Now, as you can see by the geometries that I've drawn on here, I've already created training data. And I've created data for 2019 and also for 2009 because we will be doing that for our time series to do a decadal analysis. Now, if I turn on these geometries, I can see where I've already drawn training data. So for these geometries, my non-mangrove geometry is dark blue. So you can see these points pointing to areas where mangroves are not found. And then mangroves are this green geometry. And if I want to add to these geometries at any point, I can certainly do that. To create a new one, you would go to new layer. You would have a new geometry display. And then before you do anything else, you need to move to settings and you need to actually change this title so for here i'll just do mangrove test and you need to change it from a geometry to a feature collection because by doing that we can then add a property now the property that we want to add is land cover and we are going to give mangroves a value of one so we will be doing this for all of our geometries that we use to train the data set. And this is because we will later be looking at these future collections and we will be looking at these values of land cover to help train the model and show it. These are areas where we as a user define mangroves as being, and these are areas where we as a user are defining mangroves being excluded. So I'm going to cancel out of that. I'm going to delete that for cleaning purposes. And then if I wanted to take any of those feature collections that I've created and add to them, I would then select it. I would see, make sure that it's bold. And then I would zoom in to any other areas where I feel like it is very clear that something is mangrove or not mangrove. So once this displays, you'll see that this area is again this deep, rusty orange. So I would classify this as mangroves. And further north on my map, again, I see other areas of rusty orange. You can use the background satellite imagery that Google provides to help kind of verify that but you don't wanna rely completely on it because it may not be from the same year that you're performing your analysis on. But I will add this area as a mangrove sample. I can add polygons like what I'm doing now, or I can add points if I think that that is easy. And there isn't necessarily a set number of training points that you need to provide. You will notice that if you provide too many training points, the model can be a bit slower. And it is sometimes more helpful to start with fewer training points and then work your way up. So run the model, see how accurate it is, and if you feel that it needs improvement, add more training data. So we're gonna do the same with our non-mangrove 
feature collection, all this area looks like it's either agriculture or urbanized. So I'm going to add some points here, and then I'm going to add polygons. So I now have these two feature collections, mangrove and non-mangrove, and they both contain some sort of training information about where mangroves are found. The next thing I need to do is I actually need to set up my model. So after we draw these training polygons, we can merge them together and create a new variable called classes. And we are going to take mangrove, which is the mangrove training data set for 2019, and we're going to use dot merge to merge it with non mangroves. So if I wanted to print this and see what that looks like, we see that we have a feature collection. And we can see that it has 33 features in it. And that each of them has a property for land cover. And if we click around, we can see that some of them have land cover equals one and land cover equals zero. So we can see that that worked. And next we are going to define the bands that we want to include in the model. In this case, I'm going to be using bands five, six, and four. So you'll notice those are the same bands we use to display our false color composite. We're going to use NDVI, MNDWI, SR, and GCVI. So I haven't included all of the indices that we have attached to our Landsat imagery, but that does mean because they're there, if I run my model and I feel like it needs additional information, I could later add that in here and just attach it to the list of bands that we're including. So next we're going to create a variable called image and we are going to take composite new, which is again our Landsat 8 composite. We are going to select these bands and then we are going to clip it to our study area. Next, we need to actually assemble samples for the model. The way we do that is we use sample regions, and this is going to work over our image collection. And it is going to take our collection that we've created, our classes, which is again our mangrove versus not mangrove training data. It's going to look through this data set for the land cover property, and it's going to use that and attach that to the image. So for these areas, at these pixels, it is going to get information on what the values are for each of these bands. And then finally, we are going to attach a column to this with random numbers. And this is going to be used for a first test of the model's accuracy. This will not be an independent accuracy assessment, so just take note that the numbers that we're going to be seeing here do not reflect the actual accuracy of the model. Instead, it's going to help you determine how well the model fits itself. So it's more of a sanity check than actually looking at quantifying the accuracy of the model. Now, we are going to end up splitting our data, and we are going to take 80% of the data within our sample variable and use it to train the model. And we are going to set 20% aside for testing. So again, testing that model's fit to itself. So we take this random column and we set up a filter. So we use dot filter, we create an earth engine filter, and we are going to take a split of that data based on this random column. And we're going to take 80% and we're going to use it for training. So we use LT to determine like to determine less than our split. And we are going to use GTE greater than or equal to to subset 20% of the data for testing. Now we can print these different variables to see how much training and testing data we are actually using. So how many pixels are we using to train our model? And if we run this, 
it's going to compute that number for us. So we can see this is our total for pixels available for our samples. And then since we subset 80% of our data for training, this is how many pixels are actually used to train the model. And as you add training data, if you decide to do that, you'll see these numbers change. Finally, we are going to actually set up our random forest. So here we're using dot smile random forest, which is an update from dot random forest in Google Earth Engine. We are going to run the model using 100 trees and five randomly selected predictors per split. And if we want more information, we can always go back over to the docs tab and we can type in dot smile random forest. You'll see there are a number of different classifications available. So cart is another one you could use. Um, but today we're using random forest since it's a fairly robust machine learning algorithm. We can see that by using dot smile random forest, we create an empty random forest classifier and we can provide different arguments. So the number of decision trees to create, the number of variables per split, um, and so on. So if at any point you need more information about some of the code we're using, I highly recommend just typing things in to the docs tab to get more information. So for a smile random forest, we're going to create a variable called classifier. We're going to use e.classifier.smile random forest. This is going to create again an empty random forest classification that we then provide information for. So using 100 trees with five predictors per slit. So each slit, it's going to look at five of these bands. So it won't look at all of them. It'll just look at five randomly selected bands from that list. And then it's going to train that model using our training data and selecting not only our bands of interest, but also the land cover defined by that training data. So it's going to pull that land cover property from our classes variable, and it's going to use our bands as our input properties. So just by running that, we see, again, we only still have numbers for our training data, and we need to actually do a little bit more to see what that did. So first, let's test the validation of our model and see how well the model fits itself. We are going to use testing.classify. So this is actually applying our classification to our testing data to see how well the model classifies that testing data. And we are going to use an error matrix using land cover, which is our input and classification, which will be the output value that the model gives us. And if we print these, we will see that Earth Engine calculates a confusion matrix for us and then provides us with the overall accuracy. So this number should be very close to one because again, the model is kind of testing itself against itself. We will do an independent accuracy assessment in QJS to see how accurate the model actually is. So this model should be fairly close to one in terms of the current accuracy evaluation. Now we have to actually apply the classification to our Landsat imagery. So we're going to create this variable classified RF using our Landsat imagery, selecting the bands of interest, and then classifying it with our classifier. So applying the random forest. Now, something that I've added here that is optional is that we can clean up the model before we manually clean it. And we can use that by reducing noise. So essentially what these two lines of code are doing by creating this pixel count and count mask is we are looking at all the pixels within the results model, looking at 
if any of them are unconnected to other pixels. So we are going to create an image that shows the number of pixels each pixel is counted to, which is done with this counted pixel count. And then we are going to filter out all pixels that are connected to four other pixels or less. So rather than having random pixels appearing in areas across the landscape that may be defined as mangrove, we are going to eliminate those because it will clear up the model a bit and make it less noisy. And then these are created as masks, so we need to then apply them. And we are going to also create a mask to show us just values of mangrove. So the final classification is going to give us a map of mangrove and non-mangrove areas. But since we're only interested in mangroves, we can use dot select classification, which is going to be a band that contains land cover values, so mangrove or not. And then we're going to select values that are greater than zero. So any value that is one is going to be mangrove. And then we create this new variable called classed, and it is going to use this classified RF and update a mask using this count mask and class mask. And finally, we are going to add these classifications to our map. So we'll see here where I've used map.addLayer. I pulled in our classed image, so our final model. I've given it min and max values of one, because again, we're only displaying mangroves. And then I've just used palette to give it the color blue. And you'll see that it's displaying across our study area. I can already see that there may be some problems in it. So we'll see later on how we may want to adjust that. But first, something that we can do fairly quickly to see how accurately think the model is from a visual standpoint we can compare our results to another available data set. So in this case, we are going to use Global Mangrove Watch. So I'm going to create this GMW layer, and I'm going to call in an image from a image collection that I already have, or an image I already have available in my projects. And then I'm going to add this layer to my map as well. And I'm going to color it green so I can distinguish between the two of them. And to make it a little bit easier, I'm going to zoom in. You see the blue of our map displaying? And then you'll see the green of GMW. And I can either toggle these on or off, or I can just play with the opacity of my layer. So you can see that I am still picking up a lot of mangroves in areas where GMW is not picking them up. I can refer back to my Landsat composite to see if I feel like that is accurate. I think these areas are a bit too bright which means that they are less vegetated. So there's probably not mangroves there. So there are a number of things that we can do to adjust our model. We won't go and do them in detail right now, but again, one thing we could do is we can adjust our study area. So for example, in places like Guyana, mangroves are really found really close to the coast. So I could pull in my study area to hug the coast much more tightly and get rid of these inland patches that I think are unlikely to be mangroves. And some of this really just depends on some prior knowledge that you already have about your study area. Other things that we can do is we can add to our training data the way I showed before. And we can also play with the numbers of our trees and our splits. So these are all places where you can adjust your model in Earth Engine after your first run.
So just know that that is available to you as you continue to make better and better models. But for now, we're going to move into our time series comparison. And for that, we are going to pull in Landsat 7 imagery. So up at the top, you'll see that I have already imported Landsat 7 surface reflectance tier 1 imagery. Again, you can search for it up here. But I've already imported it, and I've already verified that this is the image collection I want to use. And so back down with our time series comparison. Again, we're going to create a function to add spectral indices for mapping to our Landsat 7 imagery. And this time, we have to create a different function. This is because Landsat 5 and 7 have different band numbers from Landsat 8. Landsat 8 also collects images in wider swaths. So we need to assign spectral indices using a different function. As you get more advanced with Google Earth Engine, there are examples for how to harmonize Landsat 5, 7, and 8. But for the purposes of this training, we are just going to create another function. So you'll see I'm still calculating my NDVI, NDMI, NDMI using normalized difference, but instead of the other bands I was calling in, I'm using bands four and three, and so on and so forth. So you'll see that these numbers are a little bit different from the initial function we used to add indices to our Landsat 8 imagery. We are going to apply some of the same filters that we used before. So this time, our year of interest is going to be 2009. So we are going to perform a decadal comparison. Again, you'll see we have created a for start date and end date. I'm not going to go into all this again in too much depth because a lot of this reflects the code that we used previously. We will then apply these same filters to our imagery. We can reuse our mask clouds function to mask out clouds because this refers back to the same band name that we used for Landsat 8. So we're going to use dot map to add our mask clouds to mask out those areas that we're not interested in because they don't have enough reliable data. And then we're going to use it to add indices to our Landsat 7. Again, we will composite this data using median and then clip it to our study area. And we are going to mask two areas of low elevation and high NDVI and MNDWI. Again, in this case, we can use the same number values, so 0 0.25 and negative 0.5, but we have to use the band associated with Landsat 7 so that we get an accurate depiction. We'll apply these masks. And we can use the same elevation mask because we're relying on SRTM for that. So we'll display these results and see how that differs from our Landsat 8 imagery. I'm going to turn off our model results for now just to make it easier to load and visualize. So now that we have our Landsat composite for 2009 and our composite for 2019 displayed, we can toggle between the two to see if there's any obvious changes. So right now we're seeing 2019, this is 2009. And so already we can get a picture, for example, if you look at this area here, we see some changes happening in the vegetation between 2009 and 2019. So we can see that this area looks like it actually may have expanded. So 
support, this area actually may have been lost within those years. So already we're getting some sort of sense that there have been changes in vegetation during this time period. So next we need to figure out how to quantify that. Again, we're gonna create a series of training data. So here I created new geometries for mangrove versus not mangrove. So for mangrove 2009, let's make sure that I'm looking at the right layer. And I would say that this area is probably So you would go through the same process of creating polygons for mangroves and non-mangroves so that you have an entirely new set of training data that is specific to that year. We are going to define the bands that we want to include. You'll see it's the same list of bands, even though the numbers are different, we're still using the same, um, same color bands. And then we are going to create a new variable for L7 image using our Landsat 7 composite with our bands of interest. And you'll notice we're just going through the same process of creating samples specific to our image with our training data for 2009, looking at our land cover property within that data. We are subsetting our training data based on this random column so that we have some set aside to test the model. I'm going to skip printing these, but you can print that data if you would like, just to verify how much training data you have for each year. And then we assemble our random forest classification. So we create this variable, L7 classifier. We again use ee.classifier.smile random forest. We use the same number of trees and predictor variables, the same bands, and then we run it with our Landsat 7 training data. We then classify this model using our L7 classifier. And again, we can clean this up using our pixel count and count masks. So, we again create a new mask so that we are only looking at results for areas of mangroves. And then we apply these masks. So our count mask to filter out noise and then our class mask to help us display only mangroves. And we can now add this layer to our mask. And to make it easier, and faster to display, I'll turn off some other layers and I'll zoom in to that same area that we looked at earlier. And we'll see how that map has changed from just our first iteration. So let's zoom into a nice big block like this. Again, our blue layer is going to be our extent map for 2019. And then our 2009 extent map is going to be the screen layer. So I can see because there is some modeling in this area and it looks like this area is now agriculture. These are areas that I may want to clean up in future iterations of the model. But for now, let's just compare this this big chunk where it looks like both models picked up as being mangroves. Again, we can just play with the opacity of that and see how those areas have changed over time. Now, if this model is accurate, it looks like that this is displaying that there was actually mangrove growth. I would want to verify the accuracy of the model and work through a different a few different iterations of cleaning up the model before I say that's a trend that I can actually um, follow. But just to go ahead and see what some of the results of this sort of classification give you, we're going to go ahead and calculate mangrove area for our different years. And we do that using a reduced region to calculate the sum of pixels 
within our model that are going to be mangroves. So we're going to use L7 CLAST, and that is referring to our masked Landsat image, so only areas of our model that are mangroves. We're going to multiply this by our ee.image.pixel area to get the actual scale of each pixel rather than getting the count of pixels. We're going to convert that to hectares by dividing it by 10,000. And this is where we apply reduced regions to get the sum of all pixels within the model. I'm going to use a scale of 100. You want to try to get the scale to be close to what the Landsat scale is, which would be 30. But sometimes that runs pretty slowly, so I upped it just to show you an example of how this calculates. And then we are going to print those results. So now we have our value for mangrove extent in hectares for 2009, and we're going to do the same for 2019 so that we can compare values. So we can see that these numbers do change between 2009 and 2019. It looks like from the initial run, there's actually a significant mangrove growth, but I don't think that's an actual trend. I think that that is an indicator that I need to refine my model a bit more, test the actual accuracy before I can see if that trend is displaying truth. So for the last part of the code, we will be actually setting up to run this independent accuracy assessment. So we are going to create stratified random sampling points in Earth Engine to use in the class accuracy plugin in QGIS. So the way we do this is we create a variable for our stratified random samples. We can take our final classification, so classified RF, and then we're going to use dot stratified sample to create a number of random samples. So we are going to use 150 points per class which means that there will be 150 points for mangrove and 150 for non-mangrove. We're going to use the classification band to determine that information. And we're going to look at a scale of 30. And you can adjust this number higher or lower depending on if you feel like this is a robust accuracy assessment or if you um, want to run it more quickly just to get a first test of it, you can always lower this number so you can get a feel for how the accuracy assessment runs. Next, we actually want to add a buffer to these points so that we can look at points with a 30 meter diameter radius. And this will reflect the scale of the Landsat imagery that we are also looking at. So to do this, we are going to create a function using our classification values, and we are going to set a buffer of 15 meters, so a 15 meter radius or a 30 meter diameter buffer around each point from our stratified samples. And after creating that function, we then map it across those samples. The last thing that we need to do is we need to export layers of interest. So a couple things we might want to do here is we might want to export the results of our model, so export our final maps. We do that with these lines of codes, export.image to dry, and we just make sure that we call in the correct image. We give it a description that's meaningful to us. We set a scale, and then we include max pixels because sometimes Earth Engine um, runs out of space. So if we define max pixels, sometimes we can get it to give us a bit more um, memory to actually run that export. And then for our stratified random samples, we are going to use export.table to drive. And we are going to take those stratified points and export them as a shape file. And now if I run my data, you'll see that if, you, if I run my code, you'll see that my tasks tab lights up. And you'll see I now have three different 
objects I can export. So if I click run, you'll see it's it's um, already going to my drive. I could also export it as an asset to go straight back into my Earth Engine assets. But since I'm exporting this to QJS, I'm going to export this to my drive. And I'll run that. And then you could also run these other images to export to drive. Now, I'll run those, but we will not be working with those for the rest of the day today. Um, I recommend playing around with exporting images and tables so that you're familiar with the process. Images take a lot longer to export than tables, so I'm just going to let this run, but we will not be using these for the rest of the tutorial. And for next week's tutorial, I will actually be providing you with images that I've already created. So if for some reason you struggle with the export or it's taking too long, just know that we will be having images available for you to use for the last part of this workshop. So now I'll be moving over to QJS to use the class accuracy plugin. If you have not already installed it or have had any trouble installing it, just remember to refer back to the instructions on the RSET website you will be downloading a file that contains a readme file and the readme file needs to be taken out and you can zip together the main class accuracy folder and install this into QGIS. So this plugin was created by Dr. Peter Bunting and this tool takes the user through each randomly stratified point that you provide. And essentially you are visiting each point and then defining whether the point was accurately classed by the model or not. The result is an assessment of the overall accuracy of the model. So moving into QJS, the first thing that we wanna do is we want to add our stratified random points. So you can see that I've done that here. And these points will display here. And you'll see that they're, they're pretty well stratified across our main cover. And then we are going to choose some satellite imagery to have in the background. So in this case, I've used the aerial imagery. You can also use Esri world imagery. If you have access to other data sets such as worldview imagery or imagery that is more specific to the time period of interest, those can also be really great to use and really effective in QGIS, but for now we'll use the Bing Aerial Image. So I've already gone ahead and I've installed the class accuracy plugin and it will now appear under your plugins. And we can see it here. Before we go into that, we need to check a couple of things within our attribute table. So right now we just have our classification output from the model, but we need to make sure that we add a couple of columns for the processing. So we need to ensure, first of all, that all of our columns are in string. So for example, if you had a data set where classification instead of being one was mangrove spelled out in string, you could also use that. So we are going to edit this and we are going to add three columns. The first one is going to be class. We're going to make sure that is text. We will add another one for output. Again, make sure it's string. And then finally, we are going to add one for process. If you don't have these in string, you will get an error as you try to run the class accuracy plugin. So we are going to fill in this class column using our field calculator. And we are going to update an existing field and we are going to update our class field and we are going to say that it equals 
our classification output from our engine. We're starting to take out that equal sign. We hit OK, and we see that it's filled in. Now, these other columns remain blank because we are going to have those filled in as we move through our class accuracy problem. So we can close, we can save our edits, we can stop editing, and we can close out of this. Now we can move into our class accuracy plugin. You'll see here that we have this new pop-up and we can select a vector layer. In this case, we've only got one loaded, so that makes it easy. And then we have to select our column. So our classified column, which is the column that has the points classified by the model, we're going to select flex because that is our new string column, an output column, and our output column is going to contain the values that we as a user assign to each point. So for example, if a point is classified by the model as mangrove, but we as a user see visually that it should not be mangrove, it will be marked as not mangrove in this column. And then this process column is just to help track which points have been processed. And I like to click visit process points in case I want to return any points that I have second thoughts about. And we just hit start. And you'll notice that we start visiting each of our points. Again, looks like it's too far inland and it's not this dense vegetation that we're seeing like in this patch over here. And I'll just click through a few points so that you can get a feel for how this actually works. And you may get some that you're not sure. This one I think maybe mangrove, and then classify that as mangrove, but I can always make a note, and I can see that this is point four. So I can always revisit it if I decide that I would like to. And I can also go to a specific feature. So let's say I want to revisit feature 136. I can type it in here. I click go to, and I can see this feature specifically. So once you have done all of this, you will click Calculate Error Matrix, and this will produce an Excel file for you outside of PGIS. So I've already gone ahead and run through all of the points, and I can see what the overall accuracy of my model is. And right now it's about 78% which is okay, I would like it to be better. So in that case, I would go back to my model in um, Earth Engine. I would try to make some changes. I would run a new accuracy assessment. And there are ways to take the points that we created through QGIS to plug them back into Earth Engine to make it easier to run the accuracy assessment in new. But class accuracy actually provides this Excel spreadsheet with the overall accuracy, and then it shows us the error matrix. So we can see that 85 of 115 points that I ended up using were considered to be not mangrove. So 85 of those 115 not mangrove points were correctly assessed. And then 122 of 130 points for mangroves ended up being accurately assessed. And you can see that in this case, I have added in a couple of other categories. So if you're noticing that you're seeing areas that may be in between or aren't really classified as either. So in an example where you have multiple land cover classes, 
class accuracy allows you to add these as land cover types as you saw me add that zero as an option. And then down below, we can see what the actual accuracy is for each land cover category. So we'll see that here, non-mangrove was assessed a bit better than mangrove. So this is how we start seeing how well that model is actually performing and then move forward in improving the model. So to recap, over the course of this lesson, we covered how to map mangrove extent during two different time periods so that we could run a time series analysis. And then we went through one example of performing an independent accuracy assessment of that model. There are tools outside of QGIS and outside of this class accuracy plugin, but this is providing one such tool that does a really good job of helping you assess the accuracy of, model, of a model that you produce with your engine. For the final part of this workshop, we will go over creating country-specific apps and we will also have example applications of results from mango mapping and other analyses. So next we'll be moving into the questions and answers section of this workshop. Please feel free to post any questions into the Q&A box. Any questions will be posted on the training website. So if you're unable to answer your questions during the workshop, feel free to follow up with the conclusion of the course. And homeworks will also be available now on the RSET website for this training. Again, here is our contact information if we are unable to address your questions over the course of the Q&A session. And if you have general RSET inquiries and need access to the RSET website, here are links for that. Thank you so much for joining the second part of this training, and we look forward to having you join us for the final session next week. Okay, great. So we're going to move into the questions and answers portion. Um, I know that we're close to the scheduled end for this webinar. I can go until um, quarter to noon, so 11.45 Eastern Standard Time. Um, and then anything that we don't address today will still be available through the uh, RSO website for this workshop. We'll still be answering any questions that you have that we weren't able to address. Um, one thing that you may have noticed towards the end is that we had um, an issue with the class accuracy plugin where we weren't actually didn't realize that we didn't record the pop up where I was moving through the different points. There is a picture of what that pop-up looks like in the PDF version of the presentation, and um, there will be more details available. You can also have access to what it looks like through the links we provided for installing the plugin. There's more information there, so hopefully um, that helps. So apologies for that issue. Okay, so the first question, how do you deal with the SLC error of Landsat 7 between 2003 and 2014? So Earth Engine already masks this error for Landsat 7. So if, if you were to pull a single image, essentially you would just see stripes because it's already masking out uh, places where that imagery is missing. To compensate for this, we end up taking a mosaic of several Landsat images. So if you'll remember from going through the code, we're pulling imagery from either side of the year that we're interested in so that hopefully we're getting enough pixels that we can have a clear picture of that area. Question number two, how can we unfold the black box and prepare our own algorithm according to our own needs? So understanding the black box and preparing new machine learning algorithms uh, requires a deeper understanding of machine learning than what I have and what um, a lot of uh, folks in my lab have because we are using it as a, a tool that we know works. Generally, we are interested in using models that someone else has already proved to be robust. So I would say if this is where your interests lie, then you would have to delve further into a study of machine learning. Um, so um, unfortunately, I don't have a, a really uh, 
clear answer to that just because that's uh, the limits of my own knowledge. Question number three, uh, is there a reason you choose QGIS 3.10 versus 3.14? You can really use either. We chose 3.10 because that's what I had on my computer. Um, and I tend to have more difficulty installing new software onto this machine. So I went with what I already had. However, someone actually emailed me between sessions to say that they were able to install the plugin on 3.14. So you can definitely use the plugin on other versions of QGIS. Question four. I have some doubts in exporting the mangroves data from GEE. I'm trying to export the data with a resolution of 10 meters. The GEE shows an error that it cannot be exported because of greater pixel size. So what should I do to reduce the pixel size? So if you're trying to export what we worked on today or something based on Landsat imagery, the spatial resolution is going to be 30 meters. So I would export at a 30 meter resolution to match that. Um, in that case, trying to extrapolate to a 10 meter resolution is not really going to yield accurate results anyway. Um, if, however, you're working with a different data set and the resolution is that fine, what you may have to do is export the data in smaller, in, in um, batches. So essentially you could create several geometries that cover your study area and export for each individual geometry rather than across the entire study area. Um, question five, can we use this method to predict future extent and distribution? So not, I, I wouldn't say you can make robust predictions based on the methods that we use today. You can potentially extrapolate trends of loss. So you could make statements like if loss continues at the rate that we've seen to date, this is how much mangrove would be lost into the future. But in terms of mapping where that loss would occur, um, the losses that we're seeing are attributed to several different factors. They could be attributed to erosion, to conversion to uh, commodities, to urbanization. And so some of those things, we don't necessarily have models that we can use to project mangrove area. So it's a bit different from model projections like climate models uh, because these drivers vary. So it's, it's definitely more robust if you're looking at changes from past to present. Okay, question six. Um, as you write that code in Earth Engine's website as JavaScript, but in QJS with a GE plugin, it will be Python. So in this case, you uh, could you, I think it's, could you provide the GE code in Python as well? Um, I do not have this code in Python since I primarily export what I've done in Earth Engine to QGIS and I work with the user interface portion of QGIS. Um, there are capabilities of using Earth Engine directly through QGIS as you mentioned, but it's, it's not something I've been able to explore yet. So this code that I provided, I only have in, in JavaScript. Uh, question seven, what is the median reducer? Is it a filter? Can any other filters be used to remove cloud contamination? Um, that's a great question. So the median reducer is essentially filtering through all of those Landsat images that we collected. And for each pixel, it's grabbing the median value. And that kind of helps create a, a cleaner mosaic that's cloud free. However, you can also use other operators. So you could use um, maximum, but it tends to yield a cloudier image. And you can also use dot quality mosaic. And this essentially uses a default to grab the, the quote unquote best pixel value for that stack of images that you've assembled. Uh, question eight, I would, I would need to be rephrased. Um, can you please explain why FCC is more useful than TCC for identifying mangroves? Um, I'm not familiar with those um, acronyms, so if you could please clarify that question. Okay, 
question nine, the instructor is adding and removing comments, double slashes from lines of code to run portions of the code. How is this done? If you are on a Mac, you can hit command and slash on after you've highlighted a line. On a PC, it's control slash. Question 10, in Sundarbans, mangroves of Ganges, uh, from a from a Putra Delta region, elevation showing in SRTM is zero or negative Z values. So how to correct it? Um, while the video is playing, I checked in Earth Engine and I wasn't having this issue, so I can't really say more about what's going on until um, you know I could I could look at your code for you, but I'm not really sure what's going on. Um, Question 11, is it better to use points or polygons for the classifications? So polygons are really great if there are areas that are uniform. It, it makes it easier to collect a bunch of training data at once. Um, and if the Landsat imagery, imagery looks very clear, like this area is mangrove, this area is not, it helps us build our training data much more quickly. And points can be really helpful for refining the model. But honestly, you can really use either it just depends on if you want to save yourself a bunch of clicking then polygons if the area is is pretty clear to pick out um the different land cover types i would go with those just in terms of um efficiency okay question 12 in general how many pixels should a trading area cover it, this one is is not really something I have an answer for or could give you an answer for. It depends on how clear that area is. So, for example, if you're working in a stark contrast area where it's desert versus vegetation, you may not need as much training data to train the model. Um, in areas like this, where we're picking out different types of vegetation, you probably need more training data. So it's one of these things where you generally start with fewer pixels or fewer polygons and you test the model and then you add more as you refine the model. You don't want to start with a bunch of training data at once because it can slow Earth Engine down without necessarily providing um, help to the model. So you kind of just want to start small and then work your way out. Question 13, can you explain the random forest model again? Is it a sort of hierarchical clustering? Uh, so yes, the, the model works through a series of decision trees, so essentially a hierarchy. And there are several trees for each pixel. And what's happening is that each tree is going through a series of decisions and then coming to a vote on the classification of a pixel. And so the majority of votes from each of the trees for a single pixel will decide what the pixel is classified as. So if the majority of trees are coming to the conclusion that a pixel is a uh, mangrove, then that's what the pixel will be classified as by the model. Uh, question 14, how do you know if you have too much training data? So the quickest way to figure this out is that Earth Engine will just time out on you or give you an error for memory limit exceeded. Um, and sometimes you can tell if you've provided too much training data, it may, you can look at your map and um, it just may not be as accurate because you've given it too many um, contradictory pixels. But generally, the quickest way to find this out is that Earth Engine will just time out on you. Question 15, how do we know the dates of the satellite imagery we're using? That is to say, day and month of 2009 or 2019 or is it an annual average so the pixel we use so the method we use pulls each available image from the study period that we specify so rather than it being a pre-made annual average we are we are going pixel by pixel selecting the median value for each pixel across that study period and we are essentially filtering through all those available images and picking out the best pixel. So each, so uh, one pixel may come from October in 2019, another pixel may come from September, um, but that was the best pixel from that image stack. So you could use the inspector tool, I believe, to get information, um, but it, it would, 
I think to get for each image of each year, you would have to run a different analysis. Um, but I, I hope that helps a little bit just to clarify that's not an annual average. Okay, question 16. I guess all the signatures were made once for both pre post years and then same training data was used for classification 2009 and 2019. Does the Google Earth Engine base map satellite? Um, sorry, could you scroll up? Thanks. Um, does this Google Earth Engine base map satellite switches back to 2009 when I call my image of 2009? Is it okay to redraw signatures for 2009 separately for the purpose of classification too? Um, so I wasn't sure I completely understood this. I think you're referring to the training data we created. And we do create training data specific to each year of interest. So we create training data for 2019, and then we create additional training data for 2009. Um, now, in terms of the, I think there were two questions here. The other question about the base map, so the satellite imagery that Earth, um, Earth Engine just provides as an option for the background, um, it, we don't know what year this is from, so we don't want to rely on it for the classification. It will, it will not switch back between 2009 and 2019. Only our Landsat data is doing that because we specifically called it in that way. Okay, question 17. Could we select a location using polygons and points and then the computer earth engine tells us the possible bands we can use, we can select instead of telling the model the bands a priority? Um, I don't personally know how to do this ahead of time. Um, however, what you can do is you can run the model and you can use dot explain. This will print out how much each band is contributing to the model. And from there, you could change the inputs and you can provide additional bands or remove a band that isn't really helping the model. Okay, question 18. How is Python used instead of JavaScript in Earth Engine? There is a Python plugin for Earth Engine, but it's still a bit clunky from last time I heard. You can use the QJS GE plugin as well, but I find that JavaScript is the best option for now. So, um, of course, it's, it's easier to use a coding language you already know, but sometimes coding languages you switch between them depending on which tool you're using. And so I just work in JavaScript for Earth Engine. Uh, question 19, why did you create a Landsat 7 mask instead of a Landsat 8 mask? So if I'm understanding this right, for the second part of the tutorial, we were looking at 2009 imagery, which is not available through Landsat 8. So for that reason, we switched to using a different satellite, Landsat 7. Okay, um, question 20. When we cloud mask the collection, how likely is it the median composite would have the masked pixel if still there exists, if there's still a masked pixel, how do we resolve it? So you can still have masked pixels. So um, after you mosaic your image collection, you may notice that there are pieces of the Landsat data missing. One way to work around this is by expanding the study period that you are pulling Landsat data from. So for example, if you're looking at a year on either side of 2009, but there's still a lot of data missing, you would then maybe look at an additional year, so 2007 through 2011. And then hopefully across that whole study period, you would have enough pixels to have a cloud-free image mosaic. Um, the other thing that you can play around with is other reducers. So you could use that quality mosaic um, command instead of median and see if that provides a better image. Um, okay, as the median composite may have different bands with different time steps, time time stamps, would that impact classification? If yes, how to address? Right, so because we're pooling the median composite, we do have pixels that are coming from different 
times through that study period that we suggested, typically we just um, are working under the assumption that it's going to be close enough to our time period that we're still getting a clear picture across the landscape as a whole. Um, this is why, like, I previous, I, for the last question, I just said that you could expand your study period. You don't want to expand it too far because then you are increasingly, you're increasing your likelihood that you're going to be pulling pixels that are too far from your study period to um, really be accurately saying this is a classification of the year that you are specifying. So, yeah, I, I would say that the, the best way is to try to work within a smaller study period. So work within a year and then only expand out if you need to. Can we use uh, question 22? Can we use Google Earth Engine to determine the future pathways of a certain scenario? Example, BAU versus green economy scenario. Um, I would say I personally do not work as much with projections and with future modeling. Um, however, my instinct is to say that yes, you could you could do this in Earth Engine because in Earth Engine, if you already have access to raster layers and to model outputs, these are all things that similar to any other GIS platform, you can import these data sets and perform these models. So I know that there, that climate modeling is available in Earth Engine. So I would imagine that these other scenarios, um, you could you could run these analyses in Earth Engine. Um, I think I'll I think I'll be able to finish this off um, since there's only two more questions. Uh, so question 23: Is it possible to use pan sharpen imagery to generate a classification map? what would be the advantages and disadvantages? Um, absolutely. So I work with pan sharpen imagery or um, high resolution worldview imagery to generate training data. Um, what I generally do is I generate the training data from this imagery, but still use the Landsat imagery to run the classification. The disadvantage of working with high resolution imagery is that it is quite large, so it can slow down your analysis and it can, it's not as consistent as Landsat imagery. So, for example, you may have one really clear image for a study area, but if you're trying to do some sort of annual analysis, um, you may not get the same coverage each year. Um, I would I would say that the main those are the main disadvantages of using the high resolution imagery, um, and I do my you could run the random forest classification using the this pan sharpen imagery as well, and that may give you an even more accurate um, model. But it really depends on how much imagery you're using, how much it's going to slow down Earth Engine or whatever platform you're using, and um, if you are trying to just to do a time, a, a one-time um, picture of what mangroves or your land cover class looks like in a given year, or if you're looking at annual trends, and just from there, how much data is actually available. And then the last question, question 24, is it possible to perform trend analysis of mangrove loss gain in Earth Engine? Yes, so we, um, in the next portion of the workshop, we'll be going through creating a GUI or an interactive app through Earth Engine. And one of the things that we pull in is calculating the values of uh, mangrove extent for the years that we mapped. So what you could do if you're not interested in the GUI side of things is in the code that we use today, you can generate a mangrove extent map for each of your years of interest. And from there, you can calculate the total extent in an area. And you can also create um, rasters of pixels where a mangrove was lost or mangrove was gained. So you can definitely do this analysis in Earth Engine.
Okay, um, I think looks like that's it and we're over the time. So thank you so much for joining today. These the, the questions and answers session will be made available to all of you. So if there's anything that you wanted to refer back to, this will be provided on the RSET website. So we are excited to see you next week for the last section of the workshop where we will be going over creating an app in Earth Engine. So thank you again so much and um, hope everyone has a great day.